All right, so we are continuing in this series, More Than Conquerors, through the <clears throat> one of the most uh, well-known and loved chapters in the Bible, Romans 8. Um, we're taking six weeks to walk through this chapter, and this is week number three. We're going to look at verses 12 to 18, or actually 12 to 17 uh, this morning. So if you're not there already, go ahead and turn to Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. While you're turning there, um, have kind of an extended introductory quote here. It's a, it's a portion of the great divorce, okay? So C.S. Lewis, how many have read that book or heard of it at least? A few of you, okay? So the great divorce is an imaginary bus ride from hell to kind of the shores of heaven, of the new creation. So imagine, this is what Lewis is doing, is he's imagining that those in hell were given the opportunity to travel for a day to heaven and given the chance to forsake their sin and receive the grace of Jesus. So they get out of the bus, you know, the outskirts of the new creation of the mountains are further up and further in, and these angels, these burning ones, meet them. And the dialogues that ensue with these different people that get off the bus is where the meat of the book is found. So Lewis is not, for what it's worth, intending to teach theology about the afterlife in this book, but rather to give a creative glimpse into the dynamics of the fallen human heart and how we are so prone to foolishly choose the way that leads to death and destruction rather than choose the way that leads to life and glory. So here's one of those encounters is what I'm going to read here. And at this point, the narrator is standing with his heavenly guide. And here, here's what happens. Okay, so I'm going to read this. But one thing you need to know is that the people, as they get out of the bus, are, are small and shadowy. And it hurts their feet to walk on the grass because everything's so solid there. But the people coming from hell are just almost like ghost-like. Okay? So I think that's enough background. Here we go. I saw coming towards us a ghost who carried something on his shoulder. Like all the ghosts, he was unsubstantial, but they differed from one another as smokes differ. Some had been whitish. This one was dark and oily. What sat on his shoulder was a little red lizard, and it was twitching its tail like a whip and whispering things in his ear. As we caught sight of him, he turned his head to the, to the reptile with a snarl of impatience. Shut up, I tell you. He said. It wagged its tail and continued to whisper to him. He ceased snarling and presently began to smile. Then he turned and started to limp westward away from the mountains, like back to the bus. Off so soon, said a voice. The speaker was more or less human in shape, but larger than a man and so bright that I could hardly look at him. His presence smote on my eyes and on my body, too, for there was heat coming from him as well as light, like the morning sun at the beginning of a tyrannous summer day. Yes, I'm off, said the ghost. Thanks for all your hospitality, but it's no good, you see. I told this little chap, he, here he indicated the lizard, that he'd have to be quiet if he came, which he insisted on doing. Of course his stuff won't do here, I realize that, but he won't stop. I, I, I shall just have to go home. Would you like me to make him quiet, said the flaming spirit, an angel, as I now understood. Of course I would, said the ghost. Then I will kill him, said the angel, taking a step forward. Oh, look out, you're burning me. Keep away, said the ghost, retreating. Don't you want him killed? You didn't say anything about killing him at first. I, I hardly meant to bother you with any, anything so drastic as that. It's the only way, said the angel, whose burning hands were now very close to the lizard. Shall I kill it? Well, that's a further question. I'm, I'm quite open to consider it, but it's a new point, isn't it? I, I mean, for the moment, I was only thinking about silencing it because up here, well, well, it's so embarrassing. May I kill it? Well, there's time to discuss that later. There is no time. May I kill it? Please, I, I never meant to be such a nuisance. Please, really don't bother. Look, it, it's gone to sleep of its own accord. I'm sure it'll be all right now. Thanks ever so much. May I kill it? Honestly, I don't think there's the slightest necessity for that. I'm sure I'll be able to keep it in order now. I think the gradual process would be far better than killing it. The gradual process is of no use at all. Don't you think so? Well, 
I'll think over what you've said very carefully. I, I honestly will. In fact, I'd, I'd let you kill it now, but as a matter, matter of fact, I'm not feeling frightfully well today. I, it would be silly to do it now. I'd need to be in good health for the operation. S- some other day, perhaps. There is no other day. All days are present now. Get back! You're burning me! How can I tell you to kill it? You'd kill me if you did! It is not so. Why, you're hurting me now. I never said it wouldn't hurt you. I said it wouldn't kill you. Oh, I know, you think I'm a coward. But it isn't that. Really, it isn't. I say, let me run back by tonight's bus and get an opinion from my own doctor. I'll come again the first moment I can. This moment contains all moments. Why are you torturing me? You're jeering at me. How can I let you tear me to pieces? The angel's hands were almost closed on the lizard, but not quite. Then the lizard began chattering to the ghost so loud that even I could hear what it was saying. Be careful, it said. He can do what he says. He can kill me. One fatal word from you, and he will. Then you'll be without me forever and ever. It's not natural. How could you live? You'd be only a sort of a ghost, not a real man as you are now. He doesn't understand. He's only a cold, bloodless, abstract thing. It may be natural for him, but it isn't for us. Yes, yes, I know. There are no real pleasures now, only dreams, but aren't they better than nothing? And I'll be so good. I admit I've sometimes gone too far in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. I'll give you nothing but really nice dreams, all sweet and fresh and almost innocent. You might say, quite innocent. Have I your permission, said the angel to the ghost. I know it will kill me. It won't. But supposing it did, you're right. It'd be better to be dead than to live with this creature. Then may I? Blast you! Go on! Can't you get it over? Do what you like, bellowed the ghost, but ended whimpering. God help me! God help me! Next moment, the ghost gave a scream of agony such as I never heard on earth. The burning one closed his crimson grip on the reptile, twisted it while it bit and wreathed, and then flung it, broken-backed, on the turf. Oh! That's done for me, gasped the ghost, reeling backwards. For a moment, I could make out nothing distinctly. Then I saw between me and the nearest bush, unmistakably solid, but growing every moment solider, the upper arm and the shoulder of a man. Then, brighter still and stronger, the legs and hands. The neck and golden head materialized while I watched, and if my attention had not wavered, I should have seen the actual completing of a man, an immense man, naked, not much smaller than the angel. What distracted me was the fact that at the same moment something seemed to be happening to the lizard. At first I thought the operation had failed. So far from dying, the creature was still struggling and even growing bigger as it struggled. And as it grew, it changed. Its hinder parts grew rounder. The tail, still flickering, became a tail of hair that flickered between huge and glossy buttocks. Suddenly I started back, rubbing my eyes. What stood before me was the greatest stallion I have ever seen. Silvery white, but with mane and tail of gold. It was smooth and shining, rippled with swells of flesh and muscle, whinnying and stamping with its hooves. At each stamp, the land shook and the trees dindled. The new-made man turned and clapped the new horse's neck. It nosed his bright body. Horse and master breathed into each other's nostrils. The man turned from it, flung himself at the feet of the burning one, and embraced them. When he rose, I thought his face shone with tears. But it may have been only the liquid love and brightness one cannot distinguish them in that country which flowed from him. I had not long to think about it. In joyous haste, the young man leaped upon the horse's back. Turning in his seat, he waved the farewell, then nudged the stallion with his heels. They were off before I well knew what was happening. There was riding, if you like. I came out as quickly as I could from among the bushes to follow them with my eyes, but already they were only like a shooting star far off on the green plain and soon among the foothills of the mountains. Then, still like a star, I saw them winding up, scaling what seemed impossible steeps and quicker every moment till near near the dim brow of the landscape so high that I must strain my neck to see them, they vanished, bright themselves into the rose brightness of that everlasting morning. So a little bit later... He has a conversation with his teacher to understand what happened. So the teacher said, Do you understand all of this, my son? I don't know 
About all, sir, said I. Am I right in thinking the lizard really turned into the horse? Aye, but it was killed first. You'll not forget that part of the story? I'll try not to, sir. But does it mean that everything, everything that is in us can go on to the mountains? Nothing, not even the best and noblest, can go on as it is now. Nothing, not even what is lowest and most bestial, will not be raised again if it submits to death. Flesh and blood cannot come to the mountains, not because they are too rank, but because they are too weak. What is a lizard compared with a stallion? Lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when lust has been killed. So with that in mind, let's dive into Romans 8, 12 to 17. And certainly 12 to 17 applies to lust. But this whole story, this whole picture, can be kind of extrapolated out to so many other sins that we struggle with as well. So the, there's an outline. Maybe you picked one up on the way in or it'll be on the screen here behind you. Um, our first point is obligation with a line through it. So no obligation, beginning in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So um, Paul has said, now that we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. We've been set free by the Spirit to be able to live out the reality of the law to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. So, if the Spirit is within us, if we've been made new, if we've been set free, then we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Okay, our sinful nature is not in charge. This word translated debtors means to owe something to someone, to be under obligation. So, what's the nature of this obligation? What is owed? I mean, if you stop and think about it, that's a really weird way to say it, isn't it? Do you ever consciously think about, you know, some duty you have to your fallen nature? I owe so much to my selfishness. Um, it's done so much for me. I just need to try to return the favor. Is that? No. What? Like, Paul, what in the world are you talking about here? We don't have any kind of conscious sense of obligation or duty to our sinful nature. No. In fact, Think about it this way. No one lusts or looks at porn out of duty. No one covets or gossips or slanders out of duty. No one is self-righteous or judgmental out of duty. So what's going on here? Well, this word is used a couple other times in Romans. So look at a couple of other examples. Romans 1.14, Paul says, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So the word there is translated as obligation. There's a sense in which Paul owes the gospel to all kinds of people. Okay? In Romans 13, you have the same word used. In verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And then he says, owe no one anything except to love each other. So we actually owe love to our neighbor. So you see there's this, this sense of obligation. Romans 15.1, same thing. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So not selfishly focusing on ourselves first, but loving our neighbor and our weak neighbor. So I think we get this, right? We even, you know, use an expression in our culture, he owes it to them to tell them the truth. So it's not a debt, strictly speaking, but it is an obligation. So in, in this sense, if, if we use the language that way, it's this person is beholden to that other person in this way. He should, he must, there's an obligation for him to tell the truth. Okay? So, there's a similar idea here at work in chapter 6, where the, or I'm sorry, I just brought up a different chapter. 
Um, there is a similar idea in chapter 6 when Paul talks about being under the law or under grace. So which one rules us and exercises authority and kind of calls the shots? Right? So, again, pull that forward now to Romans 8. We are debtors not to the flesh. The flesh is not in charge. It's not our master anymore. We've been set free. Right? So we're under grace now, not under law or we're not slaves of sin anymore. So Paul is saying, you have no more obligation to your sinful nature. You don't owe the flesh anything. You've been freed from its tyranny, so don't submit to it again. You're under new ownership. Or if you think of Galatians 5.1, Paul wrote, it is for freedom that Christ sets you free. So don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Or you could maybe think of just a few verses early, Romans 8.2, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the whole point of this is you're not beholden to the flesh. You don't have to do what the flesh wants. You've been set free. You can change. You don't have to remain defeated. You're not stuck. You can, to use the language of last week, you can stiff arm the flesh. So a little review. Sometimes what we do in review, we kind of look at the verses from the previous week and kind of, you know, catch the context. How about some applicational review? How did stiff-arming the flesh go last week? Maybe you can share that community discussion in, in a little bit here. I know for me, um, <laughs> I needed it like that afternoon and that evening. I realized that some mounting, you know, demands, and I started like getting overwhelmed Sunday afternoon after I'm preaching about stiff arm in the flesh and I'm starting to get irritable and sullen and quiet. And finally I'm like, what in the world? And I literally had to go for a walk just to preach to myself and say, Lord, I am just letting this stuff get to me too much and I think my family's going to pay for it. So I need some grace and I need to stiff arm the flesh and I need your spirit to help me. So, How'd it go? Well, you can share it in a little bit. Um, but we need <laughs> Romans 8, like, every day, all the time. And it's here to remind us that we are not stuck. And there are resources for us. There's strength for us. We are not obligated to the flesh to meet its demands. It makes demands, just like that little lizard did. But we owe it nothing. We're not beholden to its commands and its coaxing. Okay, so sometimes the flesh, how does this work? Sometimes the flesh browbeats you. And I'm just thinking of some representative examples here. There's so many different examples like this. Let's think of the lies of the flesh for a girl with an eating disorder. You're fat. Look at you. Browbeating. Or sometimes the flesh can sweet talk us. Again, think of the lust lizard. Sometimes it can blackmail us. So let's say you want to get real and walk in the light and there's something that the Lord by His Spirit has been exposing and pressing on and you're afraid of what it's going to cost to confess that sin and maybe go and get it right. What, what, what happens is the flesh starts talking like, you're going to die. Like this is going to be too costly. Flesh is trying to blackmail you into silence. Threaten, manipulate you to get you to quiet down. You're, you're going to die. Think about that lust lizard. No, 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 no. You are going to die. This is so that I might live. You see how broadly applicable, even though it's focused on lust, that illustration is so broadly applicable. So listen, when the, when the flesh starts talking, so you have like the spirit, on, I mean, if you, I know it's silly, but the whole cartoon thing, you know, like the devil on this shoulder, the angel on this side, like the flesh and the spirit, you can't reason with the flesh. The flesh is demanding. It's never satisfied. It's never going to be satisfied with your reasoning. You're never going to reason it into silence. You can't convince it. It needs to be killed, mortified, put to death. So we can't yield to it either to make it go away. Sometimes I think that's 
the strategy we choose, is to have it quiet down, we yield. And yeah, maybe for a moment it quiets down, but scratching the itch of the flesh only makes it more demanding. It's like feeding that lust lizard or that covetousness lizard or whatever else. Y'all know what a filibuster is? <laughs> so in politics, it's a tactic that's employed by opponents of a proposed law to prevent it from passing. And so you can just like stand up at the mic and talk on and 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 on, and on until the moment passes and then the law doesn't pass. I think the flesh will do the same thing with us. Has this ever happened to you? Like maybe the, maybe the Spirit prompts you to share the gospel with somebody and then you start this internal dialogue to talk yourself out of it. Am I the only one? Does anybody know what? And then, you know, you get past that moment and, whew, oh yeah, they left. It's like filibuster the obedience. So we need to be wise to the strategies here and we need to realize that, you know what, we're not beholden here. We're not debtors to the flesh. Those who have new hearts and dwelt by the Spirit of God, which is, you know, what we've been studying the last few weeks, we we can and we do love God now with this new heart. And we want to love our neighbors as ourselves. So to walk by the Spirit and stiff arm the selfishness of the flesh, to walk in the light and put to death the deeds of darkness, guess what? The flesh is going to protest. <laughs> if that's what you start to do, the flesh is going to protest. It's going to argue with you. It's going to try to get your ear. It's going to try to work a compromise, you know? You're going to die. If you do this, your joy, your life, your satisfaction, your comfort, your safety is going to die. But it's lying. Only it will die. So just think about what the flesh is trying to get you to believe in those moments so that you're equipped to speak truth and by the Spirit's help put it to death. It's trying to get you to believe that it is who you are. You see that? That's what the lizard would do, was doing. If you let, you'll die. Because you are me, like I am you. We're bound up together. But the point of Romans 8, from start to finish, is you have a new identity. <laughs> you are in Christ. You, you have newness of life. So walk in that newness of life. You have the Spirit of God. You are adopted. You're in God's family. You belong to Him. So it's all about identity, which empowers you then to live in freedom. So the old is gone, the new has come, you're a child of God. Adoption is all over this chapter. So we owe nothing to the flesh, we owe everything to God, and, just so you know, you don't have to pay any of it back. Don't turn grace into a, you know, mortgage schedule. We only go deeper into debt. Is everybody with me here? Okay. So we don't pay God back with our obedience as if we could. He paid the debt <laughs> and he wants to give us more and more grace so that in his strength, by his power, by his spirit, we can walk in newness of life. And who do we owe the newness of life to? Him. That's great. He gets the glory. We get the help. What a deal. So we owe everything to God we owe nothing to the flesh. And so we move from no obligation to the flesh to mortification by the Spirit. Look at verse 13. And really, I think we need to ask the question, how? How do we do this? Okay, so verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, if the flesh rules you, your sinful nature, your fallenness, you know, since Adam, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, if you're in Christ, you are spiritually alive by the Spirit. You know, new birth. Now, live by the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. So, some clarifications. Mortification, word we don't really use all that often, but it means to put something to death, right? So, this, mortification, to be clear, is not penance. It's not 
self-flagellation, you know, simply afflicting yourself to try to pay for your sins. You know, picture the monk kind of with the whip beating his back. No, it's putting our fallen, prideful, selfish, self-righteous self to death so that we can live following Jesus. It's living out Mark 8. Remember when Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life in this life, you know, just save my comfort. I, I want to be in control. I, I, want my, I want what I want, which leads to death. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, get up on that cross and die. If you lose your life for my sake in the Gospels, you'll find it. That's what Paul is unpacking here. So John Owen said famously, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So by the power of the Spirit, if you're in Christ, we can do this. We can get to work putting our flesh to death. Not in your own steam, not in your own strength, but by the power of the Spirit. So we can, we must pursue actively becoming more like Jesus, growing in Christ, Christ-likeness. So this is not pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. This is growing by grace, through faith in Jesus. It's battling sin by the power of the Spirit. So listen, this is kind of what it sounds like. I'll just give you a couple examples here. I love the logic of the Bible. Philippians 3.12 says, so here's Paul, after he's already said, you know, all this stuff that I counted as gain before, I put my confidence in my religious performance, my resume, it's all loss. It's not going to get me anywhere with God. Only Christ gets me anywhere with God. So he counted all this as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, his Savior. So then he says in 3.12, not that I've already obtained this, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I press on to make it my own in hopes that Jesus will make me his own. No. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Do you see the logic there? It's because Christ made him his own. He's able and he wants more of Christ. That's gospel logic. So it's not in order to be, to belong to Jesus, but because you belong to Jesus. So because we have been set free from sin, we can, by the Spirit, put sin to death and walk in newness of life. So again, how, let's just drill in a little bit more, how do you do this? How do you put the flesh to death by the Spirit? And remember, the flesh is not just selfishness or self-indulgence, it's also self-righteousness. The older son in Luke 15, as well as the younger son. So how do you do this? Let me, I'm just going to give you a couple examples here, but I would encourage you to multiply these examples in your community groups, just talking about how this works out in real life. Or, you know, if you don't have a community group this week or if you're not in one, talk about it at lunch with, you know, some folks or after the service. So how does this work? Well, let's think about, let's think about giving, okay? You could faithfully give to the church, but do it selfishly in order that ulterior motive, God will bless your business. So you're kind of like using the one to get what you really want. That would be the flesh motivating you. So you got to be careful. Instead, giving is motivated by Grace, And you know what? Regardless of what happens, you're not trying to buy shares of control with God for future blessing. Everybody with me here? So, get quiet. Um, so, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become spiritually rich. You know that grace, and generosity of life is a reflex. It's not trying to secure anything except treasure in heaven (laughs) because God promises that. 
You know, lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. So, anyway, doesn't mean that um, God doesn't care about your business. He does. And you can go to Chris's class and the other guys that are leading that class on faith and work. It has a more creative title, but I can't remember it right now. So, anyway, 9 a.m. Um, so that stuff really matters. But again, what's the heart? What are the motivations here? Or how about this? Have you ever been around somebody who's more spiritually mature than you and maybe or does something better than you and then you can start to get down on yourself or you can be jealous of them or you can be critical of them because you want to like knock them down a couple rungs and then you feel a little bit better or you can look for chinks in the armor or you can offer excuses. Well, if I had that, this and that, then I would not. Or by the power of the Spirit, knowing who you are because you're adopted and your future is incredibly bright, even if you don't have the same gifts as that person or you're not as spiritually mature as that person or impressive as that person, whatever, you've got God. <laughs> and your, your identity is secure in Christ. And you know what? All that God asks of you is faithfulness. Run the race that's set before you. He sets it before you. So trust Him. And fix your eyes on Jesus and run your race. And you know what? When other people are like blown by you and like really impressive, like, that's awesome. Look at that guy. Look at God's grace at work in them. It's not them. It's God's grace in them. You know, there's different gifts and there's different measures of gifts. And, you know, we can humbly just accept that and be great. Praise God. So this is, how do you put the death of deeds in the flesh? By the Spirit. How do we do this? One more example. So, <laughs> um, a lot of, of energy for change can be generated from pride. I know this from firsthand experience, okay? So not from the Spirit. Like, I'll look bad if I don't get this together. I want people to respect me and think highly of me. I've got to get better at this so that people don't think less of me. Okay. It's maybe obvious, but hey, how about okay, I need to grow in this area. Lord, help me. <laughs> and you know what I really want? Is I want people to think highly of Jesus. So help me help people make, think highly of Jesus. You see, set free rather than a slave to the flesh. So, that's mortification. A little bit of what it looks like. We need to be changed by the power of the gospel, not for the sake of self-righteousness, but again, there's good news here. We can be changed. Greater is He who dwells within us, the Spirit of God, than the sin that still remains. The Spirit can kill the lizard, you know, over and over again as we need it. The Spirit leads the children of God to put to death what leads to death. He just wants to kill what's killing us so that we might really live. So, let's think about this for a minute. Mortification, the title of this thing is Mortification and Adoption. Oh, that doesn't sound like those things go together, right? I mean, it sounds strange, like adoption and putting things to death, you know? But think about it this way. Adoption is giving someone a new life, right? What if that child was a lying, thieving, manipulative, cutthroat street urchin? And then they're adopted by this wonderful family. Do you think they're going to need to learn some new modes of operation <laughs> and put some things to death so that they can flourish? So they actually go together hand in glove, mortification and adoption. We must kill our sin because we are sons and daughters, not in order to become sons and daughters. Again, this is assuming, I mean, if you came in this morning and you're not a Christian, you can become a child of God. You recognize your sin. You need a Savior. You can't save yourself. You can't atone for your sins. You know this guilt and shame. You can't, you know, work it away, cleanse it away, whatever. You can come with the empty, empty hands of faith to Jesus and say, save me, and he will save you this morning, and you will become a child of of the king, and all of this is yours. So, repent, turn away from what's killing you, believe, trust in Jesus. And then you will join us as we're 
seeking to kill our sin, not in order to be God's children, but because we're God's children. Third point, adoption. These are going to get faster now. Um, Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So we have some things here, okay? Three points. We have a father. We have (laughs) a witness. There we go. Sometimes I remind myself of what I'm got in my notes. Um, We have a father, we have a witness, and we have an inheritance. Okay, so first we have a father, Abba Father, Hebrew and Aramaic word for father. My kids don't call me Pastor McGarvey, and if they would, if they did, I'd kind of be like, what? I wouldn't want them to. Well, Jews didn't say the name of God out of fear of taking God's name in vain, which, okay, that's a good motivation, but God wants us to know him and have close personal relationship. Look at Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Remember what Josh said. He read from Mark 14. Jesus cried in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father. He cried, Abba, Father, there, and then went to the cross and died and suffered for us so that we could cry this morning and all of our life, Abba, Father, and know that we are loved and he will help us. He is with us. He is for us because Jesus suffered first in our place. So God so loved this world that he gave his only son that he might make us, you and me, his beloved sons and daughters, So yes, God is awesome and transcendent. He's majestic and holy. We should worship him with awe and wonder. But we don't have to stand far off and address him or relate to him with some sort of formal kind of professional distance. We don't impress him or get his attention with our formal and high-sounding praise. Oh, great creator God. Like, Abba, Father, is what His Spirit causes to well up within us. Like, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. 1 John 3, 1. So we have a Father. Can I get an amen to that? Like, we have a Father. Okay, we also have a witness. The Spirit Himself, verse 16. The Spirit Himself, not itself. The Spirit Himself is personal bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In fact, himself is emphatic in Greek. It's front-loaded in the, in the sentence. Himself, personally. So the Father not only sent his Son to bring us rebel runaways home. Jesus did that, came to seek and save the lost. He also sent his Spirit into our hearts so that our heart cry would be, Abba, Father. And he leads you to say, Abba, I need you. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So in one sense, one of the greatest evidences that you are a child of God is where do you run when you're in trouble? If you cry out, help, like you might think, oh, I need to have this really, you know, kind of of like sainthood sort of spiritual experience and I'm not sure if I've ever had that. Like, where do you... Who do you run to when you're in trouble? Do you cry out to God like, help, I don't know what to do? That's the Spirit of God testifying to your spirit and who you belong to. You don't have to be perfect to be His, but you need to recognize your need. And if you recognize your need and you call out to Him, then, gee, His Spirit must be in you, at work, testifying to whose you are. So God didn't want to only show his love out there on the hill of Calvary, which he did, and it's awesome, and it's the measure of love in the universe. You know, 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice, propitiation for our sins. God also wants you to know inside that you are his. Personal, experiential assurance. He sent his spirit to dwell in you and part of the spirit's job is to assure you. Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We have a father, we have a witness, and we have an inheritance. Third point, 
Look at verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. So we have an inheritance because we have an older brother. We are fellow heirs with Christ. Jesus is, Hebrews 1, 2, the heir of all things. All things are his. And if we are in Christ, guess what? All things are ours, ultimately. The new heavens, the new earth. Like, our future is incredibly bright. So yes, the Christian life involves suffering. But don't let, you, don't let that put you off. Don't shrink back in fear. The sufferings of this life are not worth comparing with the glory that will be ours. More on that next week, okay? That's 18 and, and beyond. And then one final brief point here, life and death. So listen, this is not optional advice. You know, just like, hey, let me throw this up as a few bits of advice. This is the way the universe is set up. Verse 13 again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, this is life and death here, folks. This is serious. But it's also life and death in this sense. God is leading us away from death, from what's killing us. And he's lovingly leading us to life. Giving us our lives back true and eternal life. So, brothers and sisters, we need to hear, we need to heed this word from the Father this morning. Dearly beloved children, I have given you my Son to give you a new life. A new life as my sons and daughters. I have given you my Spirit that you may have power to walk in that newness of life. So don't stiff arm the Spirit By the power of the Spirit, stiff arm the flesh, put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live both now and forever. So we're going to close with an old hymn. Okay, so if the musicians want to come up, we're going to close before we have maybe a little bit of time for a community discussion. Um, It's called Jesus, I, My Cross Have Taken. So it's an old hymn, um, new kind of musical arrangement or whatever, but um, it's, it's, it's a hymn that's all about If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever tries to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will find it. Or as Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So this loss, this suffering, this death that God is calling us to is no real sacrifice. It's only that you might really live. Okay, one quick little clarification. There's a line that says, in thy service, pain is pleasure. With thy favor, loss is gain. That does not mean the Christians are masochists. Okay? It means that we can rejoice even when we suffer for Jesus because we have God's smile through that suffering and he turns loss to gain. He turns suffering to growth. Count in all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith produces perseverance and maturity. All right, let's sing.